And I, I keep saying to people, don't fuck this up. And leverage is the classic way to back it up. If you think about Solana, it's had a peak to trough 36% pullback. Now, even if you were mild three times leverage and the general degens are much more than three times levered, you get wiped out. It's like, stop doing that, please. Just stick with the program. Oh, in what world does Solana go up 10x in a year and you don't think there's enough juicy price action for you that you simply must leverage it? I mean, gotta, what gotta world is that? X. The main institutional capital in this space is actually trading firms. There's very few hedge funds um, and there's very few big institutions. So these guys see that massive buildup in leverage. They wait for something and then they press it and everyone gets liquidated and they make a ton of money from it. It's classic kind of market maker price action. It would have happened on the New York Stock Exchange floor, it happens in the futures exchanges, it happens always. But the one thing, just before I came on today, I went back and looked at the 2015 to 18 bull market. We had 11 20% pullbacks or more. Many of them were 35, 38%. In the last cycle, um, from the 2020 low, not even the 2019 low, from the 2020 low, we had eight corrections over 15%. Some happened in a day and some happened over three weeks. So it, it's normal. Another mantra that I have when you're in the middle of a bull market that has the macro behind it is it's all fucking noise. It's just noise. And so, you know, has the main thesis changed? Is the world becoming less digital or more digital every day? More. Are investors who aren't exposed to it getting more interested in it? Yes. Is there capital flow coming in? Yes. Is the business cycle supportive? Are liquidity conditions supportive? Yes. In which everything else is noise. So it doesn't change anything. It actually gives it a higher probability of rising. And it gives it a higher probability of rising because you flushed out the leverage. I've always said it's a function of price. So if price, you know, last year was the best advert you wanted for an ETF to launch. If you'd have launched the ETF in November 2022, you'd have raised 30 million bucks and everyone would have been embarrassed. Bitcoin's done 150% last year. That's pretty interesting to people. Are the institutions going to use the ETF? Mostly not. It's mostly the RAAs. It's really for individual investors. Um, so those pools of capital and the individuals, it makes it just super easy because they can just use their brokerage app or they can use their RAA because then they can get fees on top. So they're incentivized to do it. Um, will some pension funds do it? Yes, but they still really don't know how to deal with this asset class yet. And they want more regulatory clarity. I mean, it helps with an ETF. So we will we will see it. You know, one of the headlines that will come across the tape in 2024 is some monster pension fund has taken a monster sized position in Bitcoin. It's not just Bill Miller and Texas teachers. It'll be a bunch of others. And um, you know, we will see those headlines. They will be the pioneers to show the way to others that you could do it much like Paul Tudor Jones was a pioneer in getting the hedge funds to start trading it because he was pretty early into into getting on board with it. My thesis remains unchanged. So I'm mainly denominated in Solana. Second is ETH. <coughs> ETH. And like you, I think ETH has a big catch up as soon as this ETF is done. So that pause after the ETF is announced is, I think, the start of the ETH run. Because it's very simple. Let's say a billion dollars of speculative capital went in to speculating on the Bitcoin ETF. OK, once that news is out, you'll sell. Then what do you do? Oh, the ETH ETF. Well, that's going to come by maybe June. So in which case that billion dollars goes into ETH. Now, what's interesting about ETH is it's a third of the size of Bitcoin currently. So if you put the same billion dollars into an asset that's a third of the size, it probably goes 3x more than Bitcoin did. And, you know, ETH with the deflationary asset, the more activity, the less ETH there is around. And all of the staking means there's not a lot of liquid ETH around if this happens. So it could get very, very squeezy. So, yeah, I think that. And maybe at some point it'll play a bit of catch up to Solana. I think Solana beats it all cycle, but there'll be legs when ETH does really well, much like Bitcoin started off out of the gates faster than anything. Uh, then Solana caught up and well ex exceeded it. I think ETH's chance is next.
60% chance it's a regular cycle, somewhat like the last cycle, but maybe a bit more like the previous cycle, that 2017. They got a little bit crazy. I think there's a 20% chance that maybe it all gets front-loaded because we get all of the retail demand via the ETF, and it actually is a shorter cycle than expected. If you think the previous cycle was actually a bit stunted versus where people's yeah. expectations were, maybe this is stunted in terms of time. The other outcome I've got, the other 20% chance, is that this is a, a gigantic bubble cycle, somewhere between the 2012-13 version and the 2015, because everybody can now participate and total fucking madness ensues. And I don't know which one of those three it's going to be, but they've all got a decent chance. Everybody was a little bit shocked that we didn't have a final leg last time around. So they now got that imprint, like they've all been waiting with the down 50% leg, the COVID leg, which is not going to happen again. So they're now all expecting that it to be a smaller cycle. And I always look for where can the crowd be wrong, but still be right, which is like it's going up, but it goes up more. Oh, the ETH ETF. Well, that's going to come by maybe June. So in which case that billion dollars goes into ETH. Now, what's interesting about ETH is it's a third of the size of Bitcoin currently. So if you put the same billion dollars into an asset that's a third of the size, it probably goes 3x more than Bitcoin did. And, you know, ETH with the deflationary asset, the more activity, the less ETH there is around. And all of the staking means there's not a lot of liquid ETH around if this happens. So it could get very, very squeezy. So, yeah, I think that. And maybe at some point it'll play a bit of catch up to Solana. I think Solana beats it all cycle, but there'll be legs when ETH does really well, much like Bitcoin started off out of the gates faster than anything. Uh, then Solana caught up and well ex exceeded it. I think ETH's chance is next. Then you start hitting alt season when global liquidity starts increasing year on year, alt season hits and ETH starts outperforming Bitcoin. And then you get some of these ridiculous uh, tail events. Also, NFTs lag. So we're still in, we're kind of like we were beginning of last year in, in crypto, where some of the NFTs have found a base and are rallying. Others are still bleeding. Obviously, some of those will go to zero, obviously. But that NFT space, it really takes off when ETH goes to all-time highs. Um, that's what happened last time around. And then it utterly explodes because everyone's got money to recycle it by trophy assets everyone wants to buy a punk and then off it goes again according to raul pal they will be mind-blowing in 2024 with crypto prices soaring 20 to 50 times it's like a tsunami of money coming our way people are super excited about the chance for big profits everyone's talking about it because pal has a knack for getting things right brace yourself for a game-changing year and crypto big gains ahead if you found this video helpful make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.